It was following the Canary Wharf bombing that police officers and members of MI5 began following Dermot O'Neill, a Londoner of Irish descent. Along with three others, he was planning a major bombing campaign. Police had discovered explosives and weapons at a lock-up garage rented by O'Neill. In September 1996, members of the Metropolitan Police went to this Hammersmith Hotel to arrest him. But the operation went wrong, and after gas was fired into the room, an officer shot him six times. The shooting was recorded on a security services bug that had been placed in the hotel. Spotlight has obtained a copy of the recording. Moments after this, a police officer opened fire. After the shooting, it was discovered that Dermot O'Neill had been unarmed and no weapons were found in his room. His family believe the tape recording shows he was surrendering. You could hear it on the tape. We give up, we're unarmed, we're on the deck, we give up. He was complying to all their, um, whatever the police asked him to do, he was doing it. The officer who fired the fatal shots hasn't been identified. He's only known by his code name Kilo. Last month, the jury ruled he had lawfully killed Dermot O'Neill. He told the inquest that he feared his life was in danger and believed Dermot O'Neill presented a serious threat. It's a position Kilo's colleagues have great sympathy with. The truth of the matter is, Dermot O'Neill was here to indiscriminately bomb and murder, uh, and he was prepared to kill anybody who got in his way, including Kilo. Tonight's Spotlight programme shows surveillance footage never broadcast before and includes bugged recordings of Dermot O'Neill and his colleagues. The O'Neill family are now considering appealing last month's verdict of lawful killing and they want a public inquiry. The Metropolitan Police say there is no such thing as a no-risk firearms operation. They regret Dermot O'Neill's death but point out that the arms and explosives he had access to could have killed and maimed scores of You could not understand people in Ireland being treated the way they were treated for the sake of being Irish. He couldn't comprehend that. And he used to get upset about it and just keep out about it. He did. He felt for them even though he wasn't born there, he did feel for them. You weren't shocked or surprised to discover that he was in the IRA? I was, I was. I was shocked because you think, you know, like I said, that from my experience, you are out with people and then you find somebody you lived with, somebody who's been very close to you, and you haven't known anything, you haven't noticed anything. I was in that respect. But this things happen. Dermot O'Neill's political apprenticeship began in his teens. He sold newspapers, attended rallies and marches, and helped raise money for prisoners' relatives. And he had impeccable Republican credentials. Back in 1918, his great-grandfather was a Sinn Féin MP and a close friend of Eamon de Valera. Although the O'Neill family made London their home, holidays were always spent in Ireland, much to the delight of Dermot and his younger brother Shane. I remember trips to Donegal. We used to have a cottage up in Donegal. Um, just mount, it was right beside the sea, um, a, re, a hun, 200 year old cottage, you know, and us coming over from London to the extremes, now we're in a three roomed cottage by the sea, at, um, at the foot of a mountain, you know, it was just beautiful. And we just had fun all the time, you know, just had a laugh. If holidays were spent in Ireland, school days were spent here at the Oratory. One of London's most well-known Catholic schools made famous when the Prime Minister decided to send one of his children there. Although Dermot was four years older, he and Shane were very close. He was, he was always good to me. He was, he was great to me. It wasn't a case of, um, you hear all these stories about brothers, you know, you know, um, picking on their little brothers and stuff. I was never treated that way. I was um, looked after all the time. As he grew up, Dermot O'Neill became increasingly fascinated with Irish politics and culture, much to the surprise of others in Hammersmith's Irish community. I was quite amazed how, how Irish he was, because his parents were definitely not over-emphatic about the, their Irish origins or something like that. They, um, 
you know, they just participated in normal community activities and uh, their children similarly, like uh, Siobhan became a, a nurse and a sister in a local hospital, etc., in Kensington and Chelsea Hospital, and they grew up as a normal family, but not over emphasis. And I think it was, you know, a great surprise to all of us that, uh, that he was so involved. This is where Dermot O'Neill's secret world first surfaced. In 1988, he joined the Bank of Ireland as a clerk at its Shepherd's Bush branch, but his career in banking was short-lived. A year later, he was found guilty of embezzling £75,000, half of which was moved to a bank account in Belfast, believed to be linked to the Republican movement. After his release from a young offender centre, he took a series of maintenance jobs and appeared to be settling down, away from the gaze of the authorities. But in 1996, he found himself back under the spotlight. The Metropolitan Police has never dismantled its ability to respond quickly to this kind of incident. In February of that year, two people died and dozens were injured when an IRA team planted a lorry bomb at Canary Wharf. The bombing put pressure on the security services and surveillance was stepped up on IRA activists and sympathisers living in England. In the days that followed, checkpoints brought London to a standstill and all police forces across England were on high alert. Although Dermot O'Neill wasn't involved in the Canary Wharf bombing, the increased levels of surveillance that followed would ultimately put him under scrutiny. In August, Brian McHugh from Fermanagh and Patrick Kelly from Longford were spotted on a security camera at a tube station. The pair were then seen in the company of Dermot O'Neill. They were also joined by James Murphy, a friend of O'Neill's who was a school groundsman and lived in Chelsea. Stand by, I have contact. Both chatting towards the vehicle. McHugh, seen here on the left, was the leader of the unit. He was given the code name Cabbage White by watching officers. O'Neill was the quartermaster, and for some time he'd been amassing weapons and explosives. He was known as whistle tune. Cabbage white towards the passenger side. Having a look back into vehicle, video time 939. Using an alias of Ray Wilkinson and posing as a haulage contractor, Dermot O'Neill rented this lock-up garage in Hornsey in North London. In it was stored six tonnes of homemade explosive, two pounds of Semtex, power units, detonators, three AK-47s and two handguns. Once the security services became aware of the rented lockup, a network of police teams and MI5 officers were put on the gang's tail in a plan codenamed Operation Tinnitus. Contact coming up to the junction of King Street. Slowly, the security services began to build up a picture of what the gang were planning. As Dermot O'Neill and his colleagues moved around London, they knew there was a high chance they were being watched by the authorities, so they attempted to take precautions. They would vary their routes, retrace their steps, and use false names when speaking on the phone. Meetings were arranged via electronic pagers, and code words were used, but their anti-surveillance techniques didn't work. Patrick Kelly, seen here in the checked shirt, booked into the Butlins holiday camp in North Wales under an assumed name. But the false trail didn't deceive the authorities and he was watched at every turn. Police put Dermot O'Neill's house under observation. They also watched James Murphy's movements and placed a camera outside the Premier West Hotel where Brian McHugh and Patrick Kelly were staying. They wanted a lorry to pack a bomb into. After countless phone calls, many to Castle Blaney, they found one. Patrick Kelly went to South Yorkshire to collect a Ford cargo lorry. He was followed there and back and observed arriving at this piece of waste ground in West London. By this time, both police and MI5 officers believed a bomb attack was just days away and the surveillance involving 250 officers had become increasingly sophisticated.
Listening devices were placed at the Premier West Hotel and in the car driven by Dermot O'Neill. Spotlight has obtained a copy of a series of secretly recorded conversations between Dermot O'Neill and Patrick Kelly. This is the first time they've been broadcast. Here, Dermot O'Neill explains how he will wire a bomb. If one blow goes missing, we'll still get the fucking job done. Would you build a way with a hub, would you? Yeah. You see, the, the way he was going to wire it, you see, is different to the way of, he was going to pull make a one massive eight ton bomb originally. That's because yeah. he was told wrong information. Yeah. So, um, now the way it's been done now, I'll get a wire it. In a later conversation, the pair talk about how they would open fire on police officers if they were stopped. Well, we have to whack the two of them, but then they'll have no ID. We'll have a little bit of breathing space. We'll have three or four hours breathing space. Well, the cops do, because we have to have the weapons out and ready to fucking blow up and stuff again. Yeah. Overload. Uh, I just say to any of these people, these were there on the fence, you know. Fuck them. You can just come out and all the fucking two of them. Shoot up. To listening officers, the tape simply reinforced their belief that they were dealing with dangerous terrorists. With a lorry now in place, the Metropolitan Police Anti-Terrorist Unit felt they had to act quickly. A series of briefings were held to establish the best way to arrest gang members. One option was to stop them at the storage yard at Hornsey. That was regarded as too risky because members of the public could be injured if a gun battle ensued. There were also concerns that a stray bullet could ignite the explosives inside. Tailgate has been dropped, i.e. so you can stand on it, and he's, into the, he's opened the shutters in the back. The tailgate is down like a step, so he stepped up from the ground onto the tailgate and is now at the back of a van with the shutter open as whistle too. Stopping the IRA unit as they left the yard was also regarded as too dangerous. Instead it was decided to arrest three of the gang members at the Premier West Hotel and the other at his home address. The raids were to be carried out by SO19, the Metropolitan Police's elite firearms unit. Ninety minutes before they went into action, they were briefed at their headquarters at Old Street. The arresting team were shown a video of the Canary Wharf explosion and given details of the men they were about to arrest. They were warned that they could come under fire. It was also decided to use rip gas, a type of CS gas never used in London before. But some officers didn't bring their respirators. Shortly after 4.30 in the morning, a fleet of backup vehicles, including an ambulance, was parked close to the hotel. And then, a team of armed officers moved in. They got through the main entrance, and then arrived outside room 303, where Brian McHugh, Patrick Kelly, and Dermot O'Neill were sleeping. Using court transcripts, surveillance pictures, and an actual recording of the raid, we have reconstructed what happened next. The operation went wrong from the start. One officer tried a duplicate key card which would access the hotel room, but it didn't work. So a battering ram was used to try and break the lock, but it bounced off and made a hole in the door. By now, any element of surprise had disappeared. Outside, five rip gas pellets were then fired in through the bedroom window. Inside, another five gas cartridges were fired into the room. Dermot O'Neill was closest to the door. At this point, officers overcome by gas left the building gasping for air. Okay, what's it? Stay up, stay up. We're up 
Come to that. Dermot O'Neill was shot six times. He was unarmed. As the surveillance footage shows, he was carried out by three officers. As they brought him out, his head hit one of the steps. He was bleeding heavily, but still alive. When officers searched the room, no weapons or explosives were found. They arrested Brian McHugh and Patrick Kelly. McHugh had been behind O'Neill during the shooting, and Kelly had been in the bathroom. O'Neill was placed on the pavement and was given first aid. Just over 20 minutes later, he was placed in an ambulance which had originally been parked around the corner. He was taken to Charing Cross Hospital, where he died. As the operation at the hotel was taking place, James Murphy was arrested at these flats in Chelsea. For the police, it marked the end of Operation Tinnitus, and in December 1997 at the Old Bailey, the gang were sentenced. Brian McHugh was given 25 years for conspiring to cause explosions. Patrick Kelly received 20 years and James Murphy 17 years. For the police, the operation meant that they had thwarted a major bombing campaign and prevented the deaths of members of the public. The policeman who shot Dermot O'Neill has only been identified by his codename, Kilo. This is his version of events. Through the smoke of the gas, I could see a figure standing at the door. The room he was in was dark. I did not have good vision as my eyes were now streaming. This figure wasn't reacting to anything I said. He said nothing. His body language appeared aggressive because his upper body was leaning towards me. I couldn't see his hands and his arms appeared to be down. I'd feared for my life. I was in imminent danger. He had plenty of time to pick up a weapon. I was unable to back off. I knew that colleagues to my right might be in danger. I was illuminated. He wasn't. I was in total fear for my life. I had given him several opportunities to show his hands outside the door. I had nowhere to go, so I moved towards him, firing two shots. I felt as if nothing had happened, because the figure was in exactly the same position. He had not moved. I thought I had missed, so I fired a further two pairs of shots from my MP5. My torch beam was on but it was being dissipated by gas. I pushed the figure backwards into the room. The last minute decision to use rip gas may have contributed to the fatal consequences. Officer Kilo left his respirator in the van and without it, as he has admitted, his vision was impaired. Dermot O'Neill's family believed the use of gas led to his death. There was no need, there was people asking him to open the door um, telling him to show his hands. There's people firing CS gas. Uh, it's four o'clock in the morning. It just creates chaos. You know, there was no need for it. Was it a mistake to use the gas in such large quantities? No, I don't think it was because I think it was it was usually important to um, disorientate the terrorists as far as you could. There are downsides to every every action you take. It was suggested, for instance, that the police could have shot the lock off or the hinges off. That in itself was dangerous because anyone on the other side of, of, of the door was likely to have uh, been hit uh, indiscriminately. Officer Kilo maintains he opened fire because he believed his life was in danger. Although he couldn't see properly, he insists Dermot O'Neill's whole body language suggested he was holding a weapon. He said O'Neill was bristling and standing in a classic boxer stance. And although he couldn't see his hands, he believed he was presenting a serious threat. But for others, key questions remain. The justice for Dermot O'Neill campaign is critical of the entire police operation. I think that at the end of the day, those police officers were whipped up into a frenzy. They feared for their life. They were told they had access to explosives, there could be guns under the floorboards, there could be hand grenades in there. Roger Gray knows Officer Kilo well. 
Now retired from the force after 30 years' service, he's just written about his experiences in SO19. Although he was not directly involved in the shooting, he's well versed in the difficulties armed officers face. If that officer believes, or in any physical or armed confrontation, the person believes they are about to be the victim of uh, or injury or assault, then they are entitled in law to make the preemptive strike. And, and that is the basis of, upon which um, the situations we're discussing here are judged. The law dictates that officers can use reasonable force, but was Dermot O'Neill in the process of surrendering when Kilo opened fire? To some, the tape could suggest that Dermot O'Neill was giving up, but it isn't conclusive. Very narrowly, that's an easy assumption to arrive at. The truth of the matter is, Dermot O'Neill was here to indiscriminately bomb and murder, uh, and he was prepared to kill anybody who got in his way, including Kilo. Uh, and I have to say that if you live by the sword, you'll like to die by the sword. It was the contents of bug conversations that led police to believe they would come under fire when they tried to detain the gang. One recording is particularly ironic. It reveals how Dermot O'Neill would react when the police tried to arrest him. Oh, yeah. Well, I would imagine if it's going to happen, the way they'll do it is they've got the place rigged already. They'll have a couple of lorries parked up, boys on them. And we'll be working away, and next thing, fucking bright well, lights all around. Bright lights all around, and it'll just be, this is the police, you're surrounded, come out with your hands out. And if that's the case, I'm coming out with your fucking hands up. You're what, you're shooting your way out, yeah? Well, we may decide it, because fucking, I'm coming out, you could be out for five years, for fuck's sake. At the inquest that ended last month, the police legal team placed great emphasis on the lethal intent they claimed the bug conversations reveal. But when it came to the tape of the hotel shooting, Officer Kilo claimed he simply couldn't hear Dermot O'Neill's responses. Are you still convinced that Dermot was surrendering? Yes. Yes. What makes you so convinced? Because you could hear it on the tape. We give up, we're unarmed, we're on the deck, we give up. He was complying to all their... Um, whatever the police asked him to do, he was doing it. He got to the door, he tried to open it, and he, they shot him six times. Slowly coming across towards the jetty. Brian McHugh, seen here on the right, is another who believes Dermot O'Neill was surrendering. He was in the room when he was shot. He's currently in the Republican wing in the Mays prison. He's never spoken publicly about the events in the hotel. Not surprisingly, he's critical of the police operation. According to a statement given to Spotlight, this is what he heard that morning. I was in a crouched position beside the bed I'd been sleeping in and almost directly to Dermot's left and slightly behind him. Dermot was trying to answer both policemen saying OK, OK to the man asking him to open the door and were on the deck to the second policeman. One of them shouted, open this fucking door now, open this fucking door now was repeated again. In answer to one of the men, Dermot said that he couldn't open the door, that it wouldn't open. One of them repeated, open it, open it. The policeman fired two shots, hitting Dermot. Dermot said, fucking hell, clearly surprised that the shooting had started, now that access had been gained to the room. Despite the fact that Dermot O'Neill was unarmed, initial press reports suggested that he'd been killed in a gun battle. The shooting isn't just an issue for Officer Kilo. The decision to carry out the arrest at the hotel poses questions about the tactics of the police and the intelligence gathering operation. Was it a mistake to open fire on an unarmed man? Uh, in the circumstances, the answer to that is definitely no. Dermot O'Neill, they knew, uh, was part of an active service unit. They knew that he was the quartermaster that they, he in particular, had access uh, to some of the, one of the most lethal assault weapons known to man, the AK-47 rifle. But there were no weapons in the room. 
This video obtained by Spotlight was filmed by MI5 officers when they secretly searched room 303 prior to the raid. Twice the security services covertly entered and on both occasions no guns or ammunition were found. Across the city in North London at the lockup, security personnel had better luck. They entered the arms depot secretly and removed the firing pins from two AK-47s and made a number of detonators safe. The listening device placed in the hotel room provided the security services with a series of recordings. From these tapes they believe they heard the gang discuss ammunition and weapons. But mistakes were made. The listening team thought they heard the word hand grenade, but it turned out to be a reference to Hangar Lane, an area of London. And a drinks can being opened was mistaken for a gun being loaded. Although these corrections were passed on to the arresting team, officers were still briefed that the gang were likely to use weapons. But campaigners want to know why the police didn't arrest the gang members away from the hotel. One of the police officers was quoted as saying that Dermot could not take a piss without us being there. The day before he was killed, he was up a ladder outside his parents' home painting the home. He went into a local news agent's that evening and bought some chocolates. Even the bar of chocolate that he bought was known by the police. They could quite easily have arrested him at any moment in time. About four hours before he was killed, Dermot was with his brother Shane at the family home. The security services saw him arrive and leave and watched him walk back to the hotel. Shane was also arrested that night and after being held for several days was released without charge. He argues Dermot could also have been arrested. Why couldn't they have just gone up and say, excuse me, Mr O'Neill, you're nicked? Easily. No problem. But no, they had to wait till they were, um, he was in a room, um, fast asleep, and there was, I don't know how many um, SO19 people were there. There was no need for it. Two people could have arrested him. But the police argue that when it came to the hotel operation, they had no option. This was the first time, in actual fact, that they three had come together and had stayed the night at those premises and the clear indication that the security services had were that these men were about to load their explosive devices onto a lorry which they knew had been brought into London and was nearby. The bombs were primed, they were ready to go. We couldn't take that chance. Some people might say that Dermot was involved in a bombing campaign and that the death and the arrest of the other individuals yes. saved lives. Well, the, the police said um, they had thwarted a huge bombing campaign. Um, and that does that mean it's okay to kill him? But arresting him would have also thwarted a huge bombing campaign. They don't have to kill him. Last month, an inquest ruled that Dermot O'Neill was lawfully killed. His family now want a public inquiry. The Metropolitan Police say there is no such thing as a no-risk firearms operation. They regret Dermot O'Neill's death but point out that the arms and explosives he had access to could have killed and maimed scores of people.